Yeah. And you're good enough. All right. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the last session of the day, uh, which is about a story of a CAS upgrade that Unicon and Indiana University collaborated uh, to do, and it's titled To CAS 3 and Beyond. Hopefully there are some Toy Story fans here that get the reference. Cool. So I'm Misa Moyet. I'm probably known to most of you. This is Nubli Gossip from Indiana, and we're happy to present the story to you. This is the agenda that we'll be um, covering for today's session. We'll do a little bit of intro of who we are and what we do for those of you that um, don't quite know Nubly. Um, we'll try to be brief. Then we'll talk a little bit about the existing environment that Indiana had before this particular upgrade and some uh, discussion of the requirements that necess necessitated um, the need for the upgrade and what Indiana really wanted to achieve. We'll talk about how we actually implemented those requirements. We'll do a, a quick overview of some cool features that are now implemented uh, as part of that upgrade. Hopefully, Internet will allow us to do a demo of what all this actually looks like. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about how we actually did collaborate and did the work together in terms of tools and development workflow and stuff. And there will be some questions, hopefully, at the end that we can discuss together. All right, Newly. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Nubli, and uh, I'm the lead system analyst programmer uh, for the Identity Management Systems at Indiana University. And uh, I'm the technical lead for this project, and um, it has been a very great experience. Excellent. Thank you. And a little, little bit about me, Identity Access Management Consultant at Unicon. been with Unicon for about three years. I'm with Ethereum for <coughs> five. And uh, mostly served as Unicon's tech lead for the project. And I do know a little bit about CAS and IEM. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, have, I'll hand it off to Newly to talk a little bit about the Indiana environment. So CAS has been part of IU for for a very long time. Uh, we started off with the Yale CAS, um, and from there, the code has been forked to meet our business needs. And by now, a lot has changed. Uh, in fact, the code has been, when new CAS come out, we would add any feature set with, from the new one by implementing, implementing our own code. So you can realize after a while, um, we would like to come back to the base CAS and somehow meet our business uh, business needs at the same time. Uh, so it has been a very challenging uh, part for me in order to find uh, a solution that would work for our business needs and at the same time you know, in, in terms of technical point of view. So basically, we just need to find the middle line somewhere. Um, all right. And um, one thing that we really, that's pretty unique at Indiana University is what we call the app codes. Uh, app codes is ba basically is just the authentication request type. And it's partly authorization at the same time. Um, <laughs> uh, I can see that someone sort of understand our business needs. Um, basically, there's you know we have staff, we have students, and we have guests, and somehow we need to, uh, and then we have the step up authentication, and somehow we need the CAS needs to understand how to authorize uh, those different roles, and it's not just authentication type, um, and yeah, I think that's. You know, in brief, how the system is being set up right now. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So, um, Newly mentioned app codes, and this primarily will be the concept of, that um, pretty much lays the foundation for the upgrade because everything revolves around these app codes and how they're represented in CAS, what they mean. And I think we'll be talking a good portion of, 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 of this discussion on. What the heck is an app code, really, and how do we how do we solve that problem? Um, I'll also mention that um, Indiana um, has 
the, the current CAS implementation that they had prior to this upgrade was open to the universe entirely. If you're familiar with CAS, there was a service registry concept that usually you just add the applications to it that you, you, want, to, um, you want your CAS to authenticate with. With Indiana, this was completely open. And everybody could at any time come log in and take advantage of it. And in addition to it, we realized that when we were starting to do this upgrade, we had to remain completely backward compatible. Not knowing who really is interacting with us, we realized that we just have to really be safe and secure in terms of the changes that we make, and at the same time preserve those that those unknown or known applications that are on the other line um, uh, can safely still use use the new version. Lisa, uh, yes, uh, you're talking about open to the world. How, what was the uh, population or user base? Uh, well, we have about five hundred thousand user accounts. Okay, very good. So what did we set out to achieve? Well, we really wanted to take the existing CAS implementation, version 2, and upgrade it to 3.5.2 at the time. Um, uh, like I said, the, the lay of the foundation was to really come up with a design and then an implementation of these app codes that IU had in place. And we'll talk a little bit about what these app codes are. But based on those app codes, we realized that we need to dynamically select the login screen. Um, and we also needed to come up with a way to specify a, a relationship between these app codes and how they relate to step up or uh, two-factor authentication, really. Um, we set out to also achieve primary authentication by Jazz and Kerberos and tie those together. And then for second factor, we started to use Radius uh, that is provided by CAS out of the box. IU had, as newly mentioned, they had adopted CAS 2, but had diverged from that code base quite a bit and implemented CAS 3 features on top of that code base, on top of the old code base. And as a result of that, they had modified the CAS protocol quite a bit as well. So when I mentioned about backwards compatibility, backwards compatibility these were the changes that we need to carry over and carefully uh, so that we support any new application that comes to uh, utilize the new CAS as well as any existing ones that they have, which uh, were up, up to 300 or more, possibly, as, as I've been told. And then finally, once we got done with all this, we realized we had to do this for uh, a cluster and do uh, a highly available CAS deployment, active, active, active with EH cache which again was something that uh, was supported out of the box with CAS, and we'll talk a little bit about how we configured this. So what is an app code? Uh, you referenced uh, app codes quite a bit. So app code, as newly mentioned, is a particular token that describes the requesting app um, uh, in many ways. It describes what theme should the app use. It describes what form of authentication the app um, is allowed to use, and maybe more than one at the same time. Um, it's, again, in reference to uh, step up or two-factor authentication, it describes how uh, a particular application that is associated with an app code could validate or satisfy the authentication context in, in the context of two-factor authentication, how that context could be, could be granted. Um, the app codes, if I show you all, and I'll show you a quick snippet of, of how they're represented in CAS, but they're very analogous and yet parallel to the service registry concept in CAS. There are many <laughs> uh, parallel um, settings and properties that you'll find in the service registry that are similar to app codes, but then at the same time, they're very different in a lot of ways. Um, Indiana does have currently today uh, four primary app codes that everything else pretty much falls under the category of these four app codes. There are Indiana or IU, Guest, Safe Word, or Step Up, and then Any. And what's what's more is these app codes can have aliases. So that and it probably would be best displayed to you if I gave you. This is a representation of the app codes that, as a sample, is, is, is at work in Indiana. So we've got a bunch of identifiers, like for IU, Safe Word, Guest, Any. And they have aliases, so app codes can be grouped together. 
you also see a theme ID, which describes what CAS should use in terms of its login screen and, and UI when an app code or an alias comes in for an authentication request. So that's also an INR file? This is a JSON file, actually. So in order for us to represent um, these app codes, we came up with a concept of a JSON application registry to represent these app codes. And much like the JSON service registry you have in, app code, uh, in CAS, and you probably are familiar, um, it's the same exact concept, except that we're loading a different data model here. It, it is being automatically reloaded. Changes are automatically recognized and loaded into context. Uh, but in order to not touch the service registry and, re and keep that as it is, we and because the data model starts to diverge quite a bit from the service registry, we came up with um, a new a new type of uh, an app code registry. Uh, and you notice that, for example, down at the bottom, um, any is specified in the in 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 the block that says ID three with theme ID as default. But then down below, you also have any with a different app code and a different <coughs> theme ID. So these app codes can have relationships and could be specified in multiple places. Um, the authentication handler bit also describes what are the authentication methods uh, allowed for this particular app code. So for instance, if an app code came in that, um, to CAS and it was APC, as in the first block, we'll authenticate that particular request with the IU credentials. We'll assume IU credentials are going to be provided. Sometimes there's both, meaning both IU and GIST are allowed. And sometimes, with safe word, there's just the for instance one. So this is, this is a representation of the data model with these app codes. And some sample ones just to give you a better idea of um, how these are at, at, at used in the end. So next, once we came up with a design of, well, now we understand and have a grasp on these app codes, we started to formulate the code base around other functional requirements that were based on these app codes. So app codes, as I showed you, back here, they can have a theme ID, whether it could be default or alumni or anything else that Indiana at some point in time might develop. Um, because they can now specify app codes, we came up with an app code resource view resolver um, that is able to figure out the theme ID that is associated with this particular, particular app code and render a different, different login screen, essentially, um, for CAS. So this, was, this was the first extension that we did. And we'll show you demos on how, on, on how this actually works based on various app codes that, that are passed along to CAS. So dynamic theme selection is the very first things we did uh, as a result of this upgrade. Then uh, other challenges popped up. So I mentioned the primary authentication um, currently in Indiana was done via JAS. And it was then delegated to Kerberos. Right? So we have our JAS configuration <laughs> file. We have our Kerberos configuration file. The problem is there was no way to link the two. Right? How would you specify a realm that specified, let's say, an IU staff to the Kerberos configuration that does have, let's say, a, a, a given uh, distribution, key distribution? So what we did was we came up with, with a JAS authentication handler extension that instead of specifying the Kerberos configuration. There was actually pretty good documentation on Oracle's site and Javadocs that described you can selectively set system properties that would, that would tell you um, what, what realm, what KDC to be used with Kerberos. So as you can see down here, if I can get my mouse back, we are setting system properties for the IU staff and for the IU guest, and that way, the JAS authentication handler could specify what Kerberos ROM KDC to be used. Um, and uh, took care of this problem. I, I, would also, I, I should also mention that the, that, that, the, that the work that was done for this particular issue now exists in the CAS distribution by default. You can accommodate this use case out of the box with CAS. Um, so some of the work that we're doing here was contributed back to, back to the original distribution. OK, on to the fun stuff. Next, next thing. Um, so I mentioned that while, let me go back to the app code file. For instance, with SafeWord, uh, if an app request came in that was decorated with SafeWord, 
The first factor that was used for authentication is the IU staff. We're going to assume that IU staff credentials are going to be used for the first factor. And then the second factor that kicks in, we started to use the RADIUS authentication handler that is available with CAS. Um, what CAS provided to us was not quite enough because Indiana also required some additional settings, what RADIUS calls NAS, or Network Access Server, that needed to be specified. Otherwise, the RADIUS request was going to be rejected. So we came up, if you take a look at this particular line here, it says J Radius Server Implementation. This is, again, something that's specific to IU that we had to develop in order to be able to um, specify these NAS settings so that two-factor authentication could actually work. Um, again, the, the NAS settings that you can specify with this particular Radius configuration also now exist in CAS as well. So it's not an extension to IU only, but also it, uh, they're, they're now part of CAS in Heracle. And then we really had to implement step up authentication. Um, there will be a presentation tomorrow, I think, or on Wednesday sometime, uh, on CAS MFA. But the, but the bulk of the work that was done for Indiana in order to implement safe word or step up authentication was based on the CAS MFA code base. So safe word or two-factor authentication requests, like I mentioned, are initiated by the safe word app code. If, it, if, an, if an authentication request comes to CAS and CAS recognizes that the app code associated with it is safe word or some alias associated with safe word, it knows that it needs to walk you through um, the two-factor authentication sequence. Now, much like the CAS MFA code base, which, by the way, is available publicly and freely to, to, to all up there on GitHub, uh, based on that code base for Indiana, CAS just remembers a single app code or authentication context. If you authenticate it as guest, CAS knows you are at guest level. If you authenticate it as staff, you know it knows that you're a staff level. And it's just one thing at a time, as opposed to knowing multiple authentication contexts, like you're probably used to with other systems, perhaps. And what's more is not only CAS knows your current authentication method or app code, it knows how what its relationship is to other app codes. If it knows that you're, for instance, logged in as guest, it knows if the second request comes in and that request is specified as safe word, how it should treat the authentication flow because safe word ranks perhaps higher or lower than guest. So it knows how to alter the flow. And these, these are all kind of represented in the configuration for Indiana. And so these are the rules that I was talking about. You can have a current app code, which is the current level that CAS has authenticated you. It could be a guest. And then a request comes in that could be any IU, guest, or safe word, one of those primary, primary app codes, or any aliases that belong to the category of those. And so the behavior that we expect, the Newbly greatly helped help out put this, put this sheet together. Otherwise, we could never actually come to consensus on how this would, how this would really work in reality. But he really helped out to figure out the behavior that was expected. Uh, when you're at SafeWord, for instance, and somebody comes in and says, I'm IU and I want to authenticate, what should happen? Or when would you prompt for the um, uh, OTP? Or when would you not prompt and just, just pass through? And what would you be after that second factor authentication request has succeeded completely and successfully? So if you're a guest and somebody comes in and says, I want SafeWord, once you're done Authenticating, authenticating them as safe word, then you're going to later on maintain yourself to be safe word and then kind of treat subsequent requests um, at that level. Now, this was all fine um, until something popped up which really got even more confusing. And that was any, the particular app code any that you see up there, um, could start it to become a hybrid app code, meaning it could be two things at once. It could both be IU and guest. It wasn't just enough that you had a level considered as any. If any was submitted to CAS as the requesting token, the authentication token, and somebody logged in with their IU credentials, any was really becoming IU. Or if somebody logged in with their guest credentials, then any really became guest. 
So not only we had to maintain what the app code itself was about, we also had to recognize that credentials described the nature of the app code that was going to be determined. If you were going to log in with your IU or guest credentials, then you're no longer any. You really are you or guest or whatever you happen to be. So that was also another uh, 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 an additional representation in the configuration that we had to we had to so accommodate. Why do you need any? Why can't it just be IU and guest? Like, what is the use case for the any? <laughs> any would mean uh, some application requires that uh, existing staff and students to be able to log in while external users, which is guests, log at the same time. Um, yeah, because when you specify guests, basically you just want to lock to just guest users. And if there's any internal uh, users comes in, they won't be able to log in. It's, that's what, uh, when, when we mentioned AppWix earlier, it's partly the authentic, authentication request type as well as authorization. Because it's basically locking to a particular uh, user roles. Yep. Yep, excellent. So uh, enough about app codes. Let's talk a little bit about the protocol extension. So I mentioned that IU CAS or CAS2 presently in, in Indiana had modified the CAS protocol to accommodate some business cases. And this is this is what happened. If you're familiar with the CAS protocol, you've got a bunch of familiar parameters to you. You've got a service and you've got a ticket. Now the the, the parallel in IU CAS were CAS URL and CAS ticket. So no, no surprises there. There was, there was an additional parameter that could be passed to CAS called CAS SVC or CAS service, um, which really communicated the app code that was going to initiate this request. And by default, we switched that if there was no app code to be used, we'll just switch to IU. And this is specifically done to accommodate applications that would join IU that know nothing about app codes, right? We want applications that simply support CAS protocol as plain as it is to be able to use IU, as well as any existing ones that know about app codes, to submit those that are part of an app code group, and so on and so forth. So that was the need for that. And then the validation response actually turned out to be quite simple. We are just returning or modifying two particular additional tags here safe word and passphrase. So if step up authentication was used, we're simply returning true, that yes, this was safe word. And otherwise, we're just saying it's password. Now, um, this is a good example of diverging um, from standards and sort of accommodating <coughs> business, business cases. Because really, you could have used just one of these and just check for the flip side. But just for convenience, there's now two of them. Um, and, and changes like this sort of complicated, complicated environment. But nonetheless, this is another extension to the to the CAS basic protocol. And finally, we uh, once we got done with all this, we enabled EH Cache, which is a caching technology, um, distributed caching technology that was going to replicate our SSO state, TGTs, and service tickets SDs across these live nodes to really um, enabled in Indiana's cluster, I think. Yep. And the replication between these nodes, data replication, is done through Java's RMI method, or remote method invocation. And the way that these nodes are discovered by EH Cache is manual, meaning you'll physically go into the configuration and you'll put down, I am node 1, that I want to talk to node 2. I'm sorry about the fuzzy screenshot. But effectively, you'll just put down URLs to the other CAS nodes in the configuration do quite a bit of troubleshooting, and then uh, and then you'll be good to go. But there are some good advantages to it. One is that there, there's no need for ticket registry cleaners, and it is quite simple to set up. You don't need to run an external process or anything else. But troubleshooting can be can be a little time too. <coughs> yeah, replication, manual peer discovery, good, good, good. Another thing that we did, um, and this was at the suggestion of Newbly again, was that when you do a multi-node CAS deployment, uh, there are a number of files, particularly in this case, a CAS properties file that you need to make sure it remains the same for all your nodes. Otherwise, you kind of end up with weird, weird behavior. So and we, what we wanted to do was 
we want it to keep changes to cast property files across these nodes to the minimum. So that you know you don't have to change a whole lot and copy copy that stuff over and replicate it through all these other nodes. And we managed to do that except for one thing, which is this host.name property that you'll need to set in cast properties, which effectively what it does is it describes who created this ticket that a processing CAS is working on. So when CAS creates a ticket called ticket one, it appends whatever this particular host.name is to the end of that ticket. So that when you just look at a ticket ID, especially in a multi-node deployment for troubleshooting purposes, you can figure out who created this ticket, why is it not going over to the second node, why is the state not being shared, and so on and so forth. So, and traditionally, the host name is set to the name of the node. So if you're on node 1, this is set to node1.iu.edu, for instance, or node 2, or whatever happens to make sense for that particular node. Now, in order to remove the need for even setting the host name per node, we came up with the ability to auto-discover the host name. So that if you leave this particular host.name blank, as the comment here describes, CAS will attempt to figure out what the host name is. And that will completely relieve you of the need to set the host name for you. Now, it does this securely so that it doesn't quite expose the node in the logs. Um, and there is there are some security concerns taken there. But for the most part, it's even made the process simpler so that you're, you're only keeping one CAS.property for the entire cluster. And that would that would help help minimize changes quite a bit. This extension, this host name based ticket uh, host name discovery uh, or unique ticket ID generated that's listed there, it's part of CAS add-ons that's available to you if you'd like to implement that. Um, it's it's one of those extensions that are uh, that are available in release. Okay, let's do a little bit of demo so that see if this all makes sense to you. I'll we'll hand it out to Newly, and I've got the demo site here, so take it away. So we got a couple very simple scripts to do some tests, and I created the link. So um, the first thing, let me show you the theme. Um, so usually, when a user logs in, they will, uh, for regular staff reusers, will be the IU app code. In this case, Let's move into the fellows. Let's see down. No, we are connected. Doesn't have to be cached. Um, so, oh well, yeah, it's like a cache. Yeah. See if you can go to Google or someplace there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, we're not. Well, let's see. It should actually. I was on it a few seconds ago. That's why. <laughs> I've had to keep blocking out the Wi-Fi and then getting back on. Yeah. But also, you can use um, on the meeting rooms. You can use yeah, the meeting room. Oh, okay. Perfect. Right. Let's try that. Oh, there you go. Okay. That's what T-Mobile thing connecting <laughs> from here. Let's see if this works. Google. Oh, apparently we are. This would be the IU app code. Um, as you can see up here, there's the CAS service IU as the app code, as the extra parameters that we have. Um, there's a couple of things that we have to worry about in terms of how we do validation. Yeah. And which is probably, uh, we can we'll talk, about that. talk about that. Sure. So uh, this is the uh, raw, the ticket that was uh, sent back. And as you can see, the, uh, the host name was picked up automatically in this case. And could you go back? What was that host name? OK. And that's the node? That's the node. It will not pick up the rest of, it'll just pick up the first piece of 
off the name, you'll not. I mean, because technically mm -hmm. God is not supposed to be part of the ticket. Yeah, I guess. I guess. <laughs> Could be, but. Um, and it, if you can see here, if someone were to come in as any, because right now I'm logged in as IU, and if you were to come in as any, you should just be authenticated. <coughs> um, the other thing that I would like to show is that now I'm going to log in as guest. Basically, uh, guest doesn't have the same privilege as as an IU, so it's 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 not even a different level. It's basically it's just a different account, a different type of account. And if you log in as guest, and then you will be prompted to log in, even though you're already logged in as IU, because now you're you're coming in as a different role. Um, this doesn't happen to most people just because you're either a guest or you're an IU user. Um, and you'll you'll log in as as a guest user. <coughs> and in terms of theme. <laughs> so in terms of theme, As you can see, the, the header changes um, still work in progress. We have oh. to change the uh, login part. The middle part is different. Uh, for now, the better changes in terms of the alumni association because they want a different look for, for their site. Um, and that's in brief, I think. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that we're almost done. I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we actually work together, uh, Unicon and Indiana, to complete this work. So, um, development all code really was hosted on a Bitbucket Git repository that Unicon personnel that were working on a project, as well as relevant Indiana staff, they had access to it. Uh, this was the place that we kept and do still keep all the code, as well as the documentation. We used Bitbucket's features um, in real time to track issues, to collaborate, to discuss, um, really just to be in touch invisibly to the entire team, and not just by email. And uh, it really helped us out, put together a task list, identify issues, um, really just reach out to each other uh, in, a, in a way that you know, history could be preserved easily for the project. And what truly then helped us to push towards um, deployment and testing was the fact that Indiana managed to um, take the Bitbucket repository, Git repository, and integrate it with their own Jenkins continuous integration instance. And what this what this did for us was as soon as we were able to push a fix for a particular bug or implement a feature, the entire build system kicked in and Indiana was able to test it within five minutes or so, possibly less. And we were able to work through issues that, that, um, that, that came about as, as a result of, of, of testing, you know, following the same process, push a code, the, the CI system kicks into action, they pull the code down automatically, deploy it, test it, and then report back issues or missing features. If there are any, we continued to do that until everything really was resolved and working. Really, really sped up the development quite a bit, and it was just a, an absolute pleasure um, to work in this matter and not have to um, you know, struggle with particular environment issues, VPN access, where the heck are all the files, how are we going to move it from one environment to another. 
And really, thanks for thanks for due to Newby and his uh, his efforts in, in making all this possible. Otherwise, it probably would have taken uh, significantly longer to, to deploy and test. Plus, it was totally secure. We didn't have to get on their system. We were at arm's length. Okay, I think we are at the end of the presentation. So happy to take any questions or anything else that comes to mind. I think we are about yeah, five minutes early. So. <laughs> you said you had about 500,000 user accounts. User accounts. Is that, were they in one system, or did you tie? Uh, it's mostly AD, so most of our users are in, in AD, and I think sometime a couple of years back we decided that uh, students no longer get deleted right away, uh, uh, ex students, because okay. some 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 of the SSO to uh, to log in to let's say the Google email system because there's the collaboration with the Google and Microsoft as well. Um, and those students could still use those even after they log out. I mean, they have a different role internally, but we still keep their AD account for for a number of years. Um, so, as you can tell, it starts to build up oh, yeah. quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much for attending. Thanks for listening. Yeah, that's why I got something for you now. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I got to get it out of my.